Welcome to Intesa San Paolo On Air, a new English language insight series produced in conjunction with the University of Oxford, where we embark on global conversations with global leaders. My name is Rupert Younger, and in this, our third episode, we dig deep into one of the most exciting developments of our age, the commercialization of space. In this episode, we focus on the opportunities from and within space. We explore the groundbreaking work being done in agriculture and in health inside the International Space Station, as well as the extraordinary data and communications connectivity that we all enjoy due to the vast arrays of small satellites now orbiting the Earth. We will hear from the brilliant human beings who do this work, people who have dared to dream big and who are today working on things as crazy as manufacturing in space to an inter-orbit DHL delivery business. Prepare to quite literally have your mind blown as we take you into a brand new commercial world of space discovery and innovation. Space is the new digital. And I'll start there. I think that that's a very powerful insight in the same way that 40 years ago, the coming of the digital era transformed not only information technologies, but in fact, the entire economy and the world that we live in. I think, and he thinks, that space today is the same kind of uh, set of developments. That was Associate Professor Mark Ventresca an economic sociologist in the strategy, innovation and marketing faculty at the University of Oxford Said Business School and a governing body fellow of Wilson College, Oxford. The idea that the commercialization of space could be as pivotal as the digital revolution that brought smartphones and broadband into our lives is a common theme among the experts that we will hear from over the course of this two-part podcast. Almost all conversations about the commercialization of space start with stories of the work being done by entrepreneurs using the data from satellites in space to improve things for us back here on Earth. One of the first people I turned to in this regard was Natalia Efremova, co-founder and chief technology officer of Deep Planet, a precision viticulture business that uses satellite data to help wine growers to better manage their crops. My name is Natalia. I'm a CTO and co-founder in Deep Planet. Deep Planet is a startup working in the space sector in applications of space technologies to agriculture. The most pressing question for vineyard owner is how to produce maximum grapes, maximum amount of grapes of the highest quality. So they're interested in when the grapes will get enough sugar, when it will mature, how much of different acids appear in the grapes, is it enough water, whether the climate is good enough, was it frost during the blossoming season, was it wind during the blossoming season? So there are a lot of things they're interested in. Being the chair of an English vineyard myself, I can immediately see the benefit that this would provide. We spend a lot of time and effort in our vineyard trying to monitor and predict the forces of nature that shape our harvest each year. Space offers a perfect vantage point to observe what's happening back here on Earth. Space observation data is currently used to forecast major weather events, the spread of drought and global migration trends. This data is repurposed and used across the globe to assess risk and shape policy decisions around everything from humanitarian aid to infrastructure investment agriculture, and of course, security, including tracking troop movements in countries affected by war and terrorism. Nick Fox is a senior executive steeped in the space business, having worked for Richard Branson for close to two decades. Our current society relies on an enormous amount of data and services coming from space, which we take for granted, whether we're getting in our car and turning on our GPS, whether we're making a long distance call, uh, whether we're watching uh, a sports event on satellite, or whether we're driving um, our boat or sitting on a plane and trying to send an email. If you look forward, you'll see that services such as, you know, testing the ocean's acidity, checking for illegal fishing, tracking ships that have got lost, helping farmers predict how to um, water their plants or how to look after their fields how to protect the forests that we're planting right now to mitigate climate change. All of these services are being developed 
and delivered from space, they are only going to become more accurate and more important to the way that we manage our world. So why is this business now possible for entrepreneurs? For most of us earthbound mortals, any ambition to become a space entrepreneur screeches to a halt when one imagines the huge costs that any such enterprise might incur. The economics of space have dramatically changed in the relatively recent past. If we go back to 1981 uh, on the Challenger Space Shuttle, access to space was costing $80,000 per kilo in the 80s. As we move forward to the current day, then the cost of access to space is dropping to circa three to 5,000 as companies engage with uh, SpaceX and their Falcon Heavy program. We're also now seeing with the advent of Starship that cost of access dropping under $1,000 per kilo. That was Rob Desperer, a partner at Seraphim Space who heads up the early stage investments. Seraphim describes itself as the global leader in space tech investment, and they manage the world's first space tech investment fund. So who is providing all this funding? We launched the fund in late 2016, and it was unique in terms of having that deep sector focus on space, and also the fact that we raised the investment funds from some of Europe's leading aerospace, space and satellite uh, operating companies. Limited partners to investors and fund included Airbus, Telespacio, SES, the world's largest satellite operator. And what that enabled us to do was it provided us with additional due diligence expertise, so the ability to talk to C-level executives at those organisations and get insights into both the technology and the market opportunity for the companies uh, that we were looking to invest into. To get some perspective on this, I returned to Oxford's Mark Ventresca. There has historically been space for space, that is literally initiatives starting from the 1950s on, and really before, if you think back to the history of astronomy, to understand and explore the stars, right? This human fascination with the skies, the stars, uh, ad astra in the Latin to the stars. Uh, space for space is that idea of core exploration and discovery in the cosmos. The phrase that captures much of today is space for Earth, which again is the, the summary of these various developments. Space for Earth that says many firms and many countries are interested in space only insofar as it provides us solutions to challenges on Earth. Space for space and space for Earth. That distinction is a super useful frame when it comes to thinking about the different opportunities available to space entrepreneurs today. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, So let's start with how rockets get to space in the first place. Rocket launches used to be the exclusive preserve of national space agencies such as NASA. And we've just witnessed the launch of the Artemis moon mission, the first space rocket launch in 50 years from Florida's Cape Canaveral. Human space exploration, it seems, is back. But today it turns out that private sector rocket launches are also in the sights of a new breed of space entrepreneurs. Hi, my name is Melissa Thorpe and I am the head of Spaceport Cornwall. Spaceport Cornwall is an opportunity. It's for the UK to have a launch capability for the first time ever on UK soil. We're a horizontal launch site based out of Cornwall Airport, Newquay, down here in Cornwall. And we're basically converting that airport into a spaceport and integrating launch into this active civilian airport. We're not shutting the airport down. This is all about integration and how they can coexist. The UK is one of a number of countries establishing spaceports, launch sites that can host both vertical and horizontal commercial rocket launches. It is already a highly competitive marketplace, with new sites including Portugal's Santa Maria in the Azores, Norway's Andoya spaceport, Spain's El Hierro launch centre in the Canary Islands, and Italy's Taranto Grottaglia airport in Europe alone. The UK has already attracted a big space player. As this podcast was being finalised, so too were the final preparations for the launch of Virgin Orbit's Launcher 1 rocket. 
This will see a specially modified plane called Cosmic Girl take off from Newquay Airport in the UK's Cornwall, with Launcher 1 attached under one of its wings. At 35,000 feet, the Launcher 1 rocket will be detached before it fires its rockets and heads up into the low Earth orbit, a slice of space between 150 kilometers to 1,000 kilometers above the Earth. In a playful twist, the launch is named Start Me Up, a tribute to one of the most iconic British rock and roll bands of all time, the Rolling Stones. All of Virgin Orbit's launches have been named to celebrate iconic moments in Virgin's long musical history. Launcher 1 will carry seven payloads into this low Earth orbit. Client payloads include the first ever satellite launched by the Sultanate of Oman, focused on Earth observation, a space manufacturing platform by Spaceforge from Wales, and a maritime monitoring payload built by England's Horizon Technologies, among others. So how did Spaceport Cornwall win this great prize? There's such an amazing industry already here in the UK that has been here for a very long time, you know, around Harwell and Glasgow. And and for us, it's just building on, on their shoulders, really, um, and providing a capability that they've never had in the UK. It's, it's pretty much with us a red carpet service to space. Intrigued by the idea of manufacturing in space, I spoke with Josh Weston, CEO and co-founder of SpaceForge. SpaceForge is an in-space manufacturing company building the world's first returnable and relaunchable satellite platform, the Forge Star, to create materials simply impossible to make on planet Earth. Manufacturing products in space can benefit almost any industry. Earth is a wonderful place to live. We we all know that. Um, you know, it has air that we breathe. It has food that we can eat. It's the only planet with Wagamama. Um, but importantly, it is a terrible place to build. So what exactly are the benefits of manufacturing in space? There are three main benefits to producing uh, materials in space. Uh, microgravity, high purity vacuum uh, and extreme temperatures. Microgravity is incredibly important because essentially that prevents uh, buoyancy from having an effect in something we're looking to produce. A high purity vacuum in space, that vacuum is naturally present. So we're not having to invest in huge amounts of uh, crudely pumping equipment to remove atmosphere from a place it already is because we are without in space. Finally, extreme temperatures. Uh, you can access at sort of low Earth orbit, so between 500 and 800 kilometers altitude, plus 250 degrees Celsius or minus 250 degrees Celsius, which isn't far off zero Kelvin, uh, the absolute coldest we've ever known to achieve, um, simply by, by turning your satellite around, spinning it up and, and choosing it to face another direction from the one it was previously. This is pretty cool stuff. And it's exciting to think of the possibilities for dramatic innovations when you can start to utilise this sort of manufacturing capability. I'm immediately imagining superhero suits of armour or hyperspeed microtrips. But Josh brings me slightly back towards Earth, suggesting possible clients as follows. I would probably describe them as automotive, renewable energy and telecommunications. That comes down to, to two primary reasons. One, as humans, we all need transport, energy, and ways to communicate. Two, because we all need those things, they are resilient and growing markets in themselves. Researching new space companies is super fun. There are literally some bonkers ideas out there looking for funding, but also a heap of super smart businesses where you can't help but think, I wish I had thought of that. One of these is Deorbit, based in Italy. So I'm uh, Luca Rossettini. I'm the CEO and uh, founder of The Orbit. The Orbit is a, a, a space logistics company. Uh, we provide a transportation logistics service for satellites. So we do what typically a logistics companies, uh, uh, what logistic companies do on Earth, moving packages from A to B. We do it in orbit, moving satellites from A to B. So how exactly will this work? Basically, if you want to ship a package, you go to the DHL or FedEx website, you put the, how big is the package, the mass, where you want to send it, uh, how fast, and if you want to ship it through like boat or plane, right? And then you click a button and then you get the, like how much, how much you are going to pay. 
We do the same for satellites. So you come to us, you have 10 satellites, you want to put them in uh, like three different orbits, three, three different planes, and you want to go as fast as possible because time is money for satellite operators, and then we will take care of that. We can uh, uh, like save uh, up to 85% time from launch to revenues for our customers, and revenues is a very important word, but also 45% of cost of deploying the entire constellations. Because with one mission, you can go into multiple orbits that it's uh, not possible using a standard rocket. We could talk for hours about the different entrepreneurial businesses leveraging space for a better living on Earth. And it turns out that space for Earth is being powered not just by the constellations of data satellites, but also from research parks situated inside the International Space Station itself. As of today, there are two fully operational space stations in low Earth orbit. The International Space Station, which is a multinational collaborative involving the space agencies from the US, Russia, Japan, Canada, as well as the European Space Agency, and then China's more recently launched Tiangong Space Station. Space stations are already exciting research parks, and there are now plans afoot to launch a tender for the manufacture, launch, and operation of a new commercial station to replace the aging International Space Station. This offers huge potential for much more ambitious in-space projects and applications, as well as opportunities for human exploration. These are the voyages of the starship Enterprise. Its five-year mission, to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. The ISS has to date hosted over 250 astronauts and cosmonauts from around 20 countries and thousands of groundbreaking research experiments, including the development of drugs for cancer, Alzheimer's, and muscular dystrophy. It also plays an important role in commercial product research, with Procter & Gamble, to name just one, using low atmosphere to develop and enhance its household goods products, including fabric softeners. Four contracts have been awarded to companies bidding to build the replacement to the International Space Station. Companies interested include Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin, Sierra Space, Northrop Grumman, Axiom Space, Lockheed Martin, and Nanorax. So why is this such an exciting opportunity? Nick Fox. You can see it in, in a couple of different ways. You can see them as, as um, research parks is probably one way of looking at them. So in the way that we have science research parks on the edges of towns or in universities like Oxford, um, you will see these being research parks where different academic and scientific and commercial organizations will be able to test and try out different services from space. So there's certainly a, a very big R&D and testing um, center in space. They will also be um, potentially areas where you can fix and, and um, repair satellites potentially um, so that you could have kind of mechanical arms, almost James Bond-like hanging off the space stations to grab satellites um, or, or to repair stuff and be brought back to um, by kind of the RAC or the AA of space to help you fix those in a more visionary way. These could be stepping stones uh, or kind of uh, resting points before you do long missions. So you could have people stay there for a while before they go on to the next one and the next one. That That's probably, you know, several years away, but there's definitely people who see them as stepping stones to refuel um, and to, to drive on. But at the moment, the first wave I see of space stations are really these research parks where people can take research and experiments up and humans can go and test some of the stuff in space. This is heady stuff, the stuff of Hollywood. But it is exciting to see the possibility of at least part of this vision being turned into some form of reality in the foreseeable future. Commercial viability will be key to whoever is awarded the new space station contract. Naturally, there are concerns given the relative lack of proven market for such things as space manufacturing, space logistics and, of course, eventually space tourism. So what are the economics of all this? Well, 
the space economy today is valued at around $500 billion. Despite our current economic slowdown, many expect space spending to continue to rise, with the Space Foundation expecting the space economy to grow beyond $634 billion by 2026. And Citigroup, the investment bank, predicts the market will be worth $1 trillion a year by 2040. But revenues from space stations themselves come in at more modest projections. Some forecasts see this to be between $500 billion and $1 billion of revenue per annum, while the costs of operating the space station are expected to be between $500 million and $2 billion per annum, according to the Science and Technology Policy Institute in the US. That makes the economics challenging, making such a project only for the brave. Nanorax, one of the bidders, is providing hardware and mission management expertise to the George Washington Center Science Park, which is already operational on the International Space Station. It plans to work with Lockheed Martin to build a new inflatable space station called Starlab. Two other bidders, Blue Origin and Sierra Space, are proposing the Orbital Reef, a 30,000 square feet ecosystem of different habitats for industry, research and tourism. Northrop Grumman, as yet, has no build partner for its ambitions. Oxford's Mark Ventresca sets out some of the possibilities that could emerge from this new commercial space station and the growing constellation of small form orbiting satellites. There's a standard litany. In, in, in real time, in plausible five to ten years, I think it is harnessing satellite data to create you know, remarkable possibilities. Our colleagues at the Smith School have the Spatial Finance Initiative. They're interested in using satellite data to turn what right now are rough and crude measures of risk in the financial markets around climate change into data-based actually. So one zone of activity is the promise of new and different and better kinds of data to improve our ability to model and predict risk. A second are issues around developments in medicine in space, what can we learn about uh, rehabilitating spinal cord injuries when we have zero gravity experiments to, to relearn and imagine how we might intervene in previously untouchable, unmanageable medical activity? Uh, a third, I think, are the, the kind of what we just talked about, the efforts to revitalize democracy by using debates over space governance, jurisdiction, and stewardship to reanimate basic questions of politics, uh, democracy, and alternatives to the currently polarized worlds that we have. So like any domain of science, that will always have partisan politics. But I think space, the, the, the legacy of looking at the stars and imagining and hoping for something better, uh, as well as the legacy of fear that comes from the unknown, I think that's a way to reanimate institutional politics on the Earth. These are important and valuable ambitions, offering the promise of solutions to solve humanity's most pressing challenges. But what of humans in space, human space travel and the associated ambitions around space living? I turned first to Nick Fox to ask him about space tourism, given the knowledge he has built up working alongside Richard Branson for so many years. What you've seen over the last 15 years is this development of a technology um, that, it, that has made it more accessible. People um, are able now to go and, and experience weightlessness through private operations, which they weren't able to do two decades ago. And that really has been driven by the private sector, by Elon Musk and his desire um, to ultimately go to Mars. Um, and in the interim, trying out a number of, if you like, short-haul space trips before his long-haul ambition to go to Mars, and by Richard Branson with Virgin Galactic and by Jeff Bezos with Blue Origin, driving innovation, driving new forms of, of spacecraft that allow the average human to become an astronaut within weeks without any real formal training, um, some health checks and, and some general training. In May of 2020, Elon Musk's SpaceX made history as the first private company to send humans into space. Seats were sold to some of the wealthiest in our society to experience weightlessness for a few minutes. 
But the ambition of these billionaires stretches far beyond this initial step. For them, the prospect is real that humans could go into space for extended periods of time. To build and to launch has all come rapidly down, still expensive, but compared to what it was 20 years ago. And that has opened up opportunities for people to develop services and to piggyback off people like Elon Musk to launch these services and then to build data and analysis to sell to people. That will create another sway, the very valuable companies. But what you'll see over the next five to 10 years is a steady growth in the value of those space companies as they prove their business models and they prove their everyday services to our world. And then you'll see real value created. And, and I think the pioneers in that world will, will become you know, successful entrepreneurs and, and will become very wealthy. Nick Fox again. This begs the question of whether space should be a place where the billionaires of today and tomorrow set the rules and control the opportunities that are fast emerging. Despite the recent media, I don't think it is a billionaire's playground yet. The last three or four years of auctioning off seats for a couple of hundred million dollars or hundred million pounds to go into space for five minutes, I think that's newsworthy and noteworthy. And I think like any kind of drama, it engages the attention. So I'm, and here I'm really quoting one of my colleagues, Laura Edwards, one of the team that works with us, who says that kind of media is incredibly good. It has reawakened interest in space. It has re-engaged hundreds of millions of people around the world in paying attention to what's happening in low Earth orbit and beyond. And so her view, and I would share this, that's not a bad thing. Do billionaires dominate space? I don't think so. Uh, are their activities enormous, doing enormous amounts of public relations good and media attention good? Yes. The real test though now is going to become, what do we do about that? Oxford's Mark Ventresca. Melissa Thorpe from Spaceport Cornwall agrees, acknowledging the role of billionaires, but also pointing to the diversity of people who are being attracted because of this profile into this exciting industry. I asked her why that was happening now. There's just new humans involved that were never really allowed in the club before. And, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head where it was so protected by government and space agencies and military um, and secretive and closed off. And it felt like we couldn't access it if you weren't in that club. Um, and that's starting to change. And you, it, it all kind of goes back to these billionaires and obviously they they get a lot of grief but at the same time what they've done is open up this industry to business for the first time so much so that they're now kind of in control of it but you know bringing new entrants to the marketplace a lot of which don't have a space background um but have new ways of thinking of things and new ways of doing things and processes is just absolutely, I go to these conferences all around the world of space conferences and exhibitions, and it's it's just incredible what is going on in this industry and so surprising at who's doing it. Um, the young people, you know, people from all different backgrounds and ethnicities, women, it's, it's such a powerful movement, I feel, in the industry that's happening at the moment. So it's not just billionaires who are pushing forward space for space economy. I turned back to Luca at D Orbit, who like some other more visionary entrepreneurs are already preparing and imagining the ancillary activities that space for space will require. Our goal is really to create this uh, connection uh, between uh, uh, Mars, asteroid belt, moon and earth, uh, pretty much like islands in, uh, on the sea, they are connected through boats, but these special boats, these special spacecraft are capable of transporting goods, people, but also information. Let's not forget that today our society is strictly uh, connected to, to the cloud. We will have a cloud in space that will be enable all this movement. I mean, if we we cannot wait, uh, you know, several minutes just to get information from Mars, right? So uh, we need to have a, a cloud computing network that will allow also to keep the cost 
as low as possible. So the cloud will perform all the computational, let's say, work. And then the spacecrafts will just have a minimum amount of computational capabilities, and they will move around the, the solar system in order to accomplish the, the tasks that they have to do. So the commercial space economy is here. It's vibrant. It's growing. It's attracting some of the biggest risk takers in the world. And as a result, a new space market has emerged for entrepreneurs and imagineers across all ages and backgrounds. Seraphim's Rob Despera and his team are leading the charge when it comes to opening and financing the opportunity for this wider group of private individuals. I think what's really interesting, if you look at when we first came to market in 2016, 1.5 billion was invested by private investors into space startups pre-IPO globally. As we look at the last 12 months to the end of June, that figure is just under 12 and a half billion being invested by the private sector and startups. So this is a point, a real point of inflection for the industry. And it's one of the fastest growing areas of venture investment globally. This is a long way from where things used to be. And it seems very clear that a high risk appetite and persistence is absolutely the key to success. So I do remember I was in Houston, it was still 2010, so the company was not created yet. And we were running a business plan competition there. It was a space company, so they came to listen to our pitch. And, uh, <laughs> and at the end of the pitch, uh, they said, guys, you should go you should go back to school and study, but not to the university. Go back directly to the high school. Luca and his team took this insult on the chin, but several years later took some early funding from the European Space Agency for exactly the same idea. But that's what entrepreneurs do, right? They never give up. Entrepreneurs in this case are fundamentally category builders. They are, entrepreneurs are are actors that actually use what they call a sequence of claiming, demarcating, and controlling the market. So claiming is using narrative and storytelling and myths to begin to claim a space that's not yet settled. Then they begin to demarcate it. What that means is they say, you're part of our value system, you're part of the value chain, you're not, you're in, you're out. You know, They begin to demarcate uh, what in more familiar strategy terms we might call a supply chain or a value creating system. Uh, and then they they control that, they patrol that using acquisitions or uh, lobbying or legal tools or financial tools, investment. In our next episode, part two of our series on the commercialization of space, we will ask some of the pressing questions around how this emerging market should be governed. What areas should be regulated? How can we deal with the growing problem of space junk which already threatens the crucial monitoring done by the myriad of small satellites orbiting the Earth. And who might be the right people to do all that? I look forward to discussing all this and more in part two. See you there.